So in one one we went through we went through and introduced limits, uh, and we talked about you know one technique to finding a limit or the first thing we try is we always just try direct substitution. So you can just take the value and plug it in and it tells you what the limit is. Sometimes though that doesn't work, and I want to go through this first example. I'll kind of show that to you. Um, if I try doing this direct substitution on this one, right, I get zero up on top. If I plug in the bottom, I get zero times one, so I get a zero on the bottom. Well, that means it's undefined, right? You can't divide by zero. You can't have a zero in the denominator. So direct substitution doesn't work. When this happens, though, usually when you end up with zero over zero, what that means is that there's still a, a possible limit. In fact, there probably is a limit. Um, we just you just can't find it through direct substitution. Usually in these cases, what it means is that if you were to look at the graph, that when x equals zero, there's probably a hole in the graph. And if you remember when we talked about limits, if there's a hole in the graph, it still has a limit because as you come from both sides, it still approaches the same y value. What we're going to do today then is talk about some strategies or some algebra techniques that can help us change the form of the equation so that we can do direct substitution. So if you look at number one, what I'm going to do is, the, and this is the first strategy, if it's a rational fraction, is you can try reducing the, the function down and once it's reduced, then try direct substitution again. So if you look at this first example, I've got an x on the top and the bottom. Those x's just reduce, which leaves me with a 1 on top. So that leaves me with the limit as x approaches 0 of 1 over x plus 1. Okay, now I'm going to try direct substitution again. Now I plug 0 in. I'm okay. I end up with 1 over 0 plus 1, so 1 over 1. So my limit... Right, came out to come out to be one. So using those algebra techniques, in this case, it was just reducing. Uh, we were able to change the change the form in order to um, in order to get still get a solution, still get an answer. Okay, look at number two. I have x minus two over x squared minus four. So if I plug in two, uh, two minus zero on top is zero. Two squared minus four on the bottom is zero. So I end up with zero over zero. That's a good indicator again. That's that that tells us that there's probably a limit. Uh, we just have to maybe change the form before we can find it. So I'm going to take the x minus two over x squared minus four. I'm going to make sure everything's factored. The x minus two does not factor, so I'm just going to leave it alone. Uh, the x squared minus four does factor. That is the difference of squares. It factors to the x minus two and x plus two. That works out well because now I have a factor of x minus 2 and a factor of x minus 2, so I can reduce that. So I end up with 1 over x plus 2. Now I'm going to take 2 and plug it back into that. So when I plug 2 into that, I get 1 over 2 plus 2 is 4. So I end up getting 1 fourth. Look at number 3. Now number 3... Uh, if I just plug one in, I still get zero over zero. Make sure you always check that direct substitution. There'll be a couple on your assignment that you'll look like you have to reduce or work with, but if you try direct substitution, they really just work. You don't have to change the form. This one we do. I get a zero on the bottom, and it's zero over zero, so that's an indicator that it probably does have a limit. Um, to factor that top part, though, that's the difference of cubes. You learn difference of cubes and sum of cubes as juniors last year. But it's been a in math three, but it's been a long time. So let me just review with you. If you ever have something cubed, so I'm going to say a cubed minus b cubed. So if you have something cubed minus something cubed, you can always factor it this way. The first time I just take a minus b. The second time I take a, the first one, and square it. And plus, and you times a and b together. Plus, you take the last one and square it. So that's a formula for factoring it if it's the difference of squares. Uh, and that's what we have up here. We have x cubed, right? It's x cubed minus 1 cubed. If you, just as a side note, just so you have this, I'd have this formula written some down in your book. If you have the sum of cubes, it also factors, and it's almost exactly the same. The only difference is if it's a plus, there's a plus right there in that first binomial. The set, and then the second one, instead of being a plus, changes to a minus. So that's what it looks like when you get it factored. Okay, 
let's go up here then and factor this. So if you look at that x cubed minus 1a, I have x cubed minus 1 cubed. So x is a and 1 is b. So plug it in that formula. I end up with x minus 1 times by x squared plus a times b. So that'd be 1 times x plus 1 squared. Okay, and that's all over x minus 1. And what we're hoping to happen, right, is that it can reduce, and it does in this case, right? I have a factor of x minus 1 and a factor of x minus 1. Okay, my simplified expression then is just x squared plus x plus 1. I take my 1, right, as x approaches 1, I plug 1 in there. So I get 1 squared plus 1 plus 1. So 1 squared is 1, 1 plus 1 plus 1 is 3. So this whole limit up here, right, this limit comes out to be 3. Okay, let's do number 4. 4 is a little bit different, and you can approach it a couple different ways. Um, first of all, I guess let's do our direct substitution, right? If I plug 1 in, I get 0 on top. If I plug 1 in, I get 0 on the bottom. But because of the square root, it's a little bit different. So a little trick, if you ever have a square root plus something or a square root minus something, you can get rid of the square root part of it by timesing by its conjugate. So I'm going to try that. Just an algebra technique to get rid of the square root. So if it's a square root of x minus 1, I'm going to times it by its conjugate, which is a square root of x plus 1. Okay, I do the same thing to my denominator. Right? If it's a fraction, I can times the top and the bottom by the, by the same thing. So I'm going to come down here. I have the limit as x approaches 1 of... Okay, and up on top, when I times this out, I get square root of x times the square root of x, which is x. Square root of x times 1 is 1 square root of x. Minus 1 times the square root of x would be minus 1 square root of x. So we end up with a square root of x minus a square root of x. They cancel out. All I have left is minus 1 times 1, which is 1. So what happens? You times a, a radical binomial, a binomial, two terms, and it has a square root plus something or minus something. Uh, you end up getting rid of the square root. Okay, on the bottom, I'm going to leave it the same. I'm not going to multiply that out. Just leave it alone. And the reason why is, right, I've got an x minus 1 on top and the bottom. Those just reduce out. Leaves me with a 1 on top. Okay, now I can just plug 1 in there. So if I plug 1 in, I get 1 over square root of 1 plus 1 would be 2. There's my answer. There's the limit. So that's a little trick if you have a radical um, a, a square root plus something or a square root minus something. Okay, hey, five is kind of unique for a couple of things. I want you to notice it's a one-sided limit, right? It's got that, it's coming from the right side. That doesn't change your first step. Your first step is always still to try direct substitution. So let's try direct substitution. If I do that, on top I get 2, on the bottom I get 0. So it is undefined. It doesn't work just doing direct substitution. But there's also something different. If you notice up on all the other examples, I always got uh, 0 over 0. 2 over 0 is an indicator that this, if it's a rational, like a fraction, um, this is an indicator that there's a vertical asymptote. Uh, also, if you look, x over x minus 2 does not reduce. This is a total side note, but just be careful. I see this sometimes. I see people take x over it and cancel out the x's. Sorry, my board's being weird there. Uh, you cannot do that. x minus 2 has to be a factor by itself because it's got a minus in between. So if I want to cancel out the x minus 2, I've got to have an x minus 2 up on top. So just be careful with that. Okay, so that can't be reduced. So what that means is there is no limit. So what's happening there is there's a vertical asymptote. So the limit does not exist. Now if you want to be more specific, you could say if it's going to infinity or negative infinity. So let's just try a number. If I approach 2 from the positive side, say like from 2.1, get something close to 2, like 2.1, I would get a 2.1 on top, and 2.1 minus 2 is a 0.1 on the bottom. So I would divide those, and I get a bigger number, a big number. If I went to like 2.01, I'd be dividing by 0.01. The number would get even bigger. So you can see what's happening there. It's going, it has a vertical asymptote. But it is also a positive over a positive as I come from the right side, which means it's actually going to go up. So if you want to be more specific, the limit does not exist. You could put that it's going to infinity. When it goes to infinity, it still means that it, it does not exist. It's just being a little more specific with that. Okay, so those are some different algebra techniques you can do to work down through those and simplify. So in practice with those, make sure you've got all those algebra techniques down. Um, 
again, direct substitution first. If it doesn't work, if you get zero over zero, see if it reduces or see if there's some kind of other algebra technique you can do to simplify it. We're going to kind of shift gears and talk about a, couple, uh, a few other things here, a little bit different. This next one has to do with piecewise functions. So it says discuss the continuity of this, of this piecewise function. This is kind of a different one. If you look at this, f of x equals this as long as x doesn't equal 3, which is good because if I plug a 3 in there, I get a 0 on the bottom. Uh, that means that the function actually doesn't even exist there. If you do notice, though, if I plug 3 in the top, I do get a 0 on the bottom. I also get a 0 on top. That's an indicator that there's probably a hole in the graph. Uh, and then when x equals 3, it gives me a point 0.5. So I don't know what it looks like. But, you know, I got a graph over here somewhere. I think it's linear. I got a hole in the graph. And then there's another point. And that other point is either going to fill in right there, or it's going to fill in right there, or it's going to be above and below it. So it wants us to discuss the continuity. If it fills in the point, the function will be continuous. If it's above or below it, that means the function will not be continuous. So we need to check to find out um, where is that point. Um, up here, this point's at 3, 5. Right? That's what this part right here tells us. What I want to find out is when I plug 3 into here, is the hole at 3, 5. So what I do is, like we did on that, those last problems, is I reduce, I try to simplify x squared minus 2x minus 3 over x minus 3 and see what happens. So I'm going to factor that top part, x and x, factors of negative 3 that add up to be negative 2, uh, and it's all over x minus 3. Uh, that x minus 3 reduces out. It leaves me with x plus 1. Uh, I'm going to plug 3 in, and it should tell me where the hole's at. So if I plug 3 in there, if I plug 3 in there, I get 4 back out. Uh, so if I kind of think of the graph here, it comes along, and at 3, 4, there's a hole. It comes along like this. And then this part right here tells us when x equals 3, we're going to be 5. So it's going to actually be up here just a little bit above. So when it says discuss the continuity, we're going to say uh, the function is not continuous at x equals 3. should be continuous everywhere else. But there is, and we can tell what kind it is, right? That would be a removable discontinuity. It's a hole in the graph. Uh, here's one that's a little bit different. It gives me that piecewise function, uh, but it, I don't know what a is up here. That's what it wants me to find. But it does tell us that it's a continuous function. Um, notice how this one, this part is a quadratic. So it's always continuous. A linear graph is also always continuous. So all I really have to worry about is when x is 2. When x is 2 over here, right, I'm going to have a line. And the question is, if it's continuous, that, that parabola has to be connected. It has to share that point. I'll do it in a different color. It has to share that point right there when x is 2. So I'm trying to find out what would I have to plug in for a up there to make it so that they share that point, so they connect right there when x is 2. So, so kind of think this through. If I want them to be connected right there and share that point, they have to have the same y value. So when I plug 2 into here and into there, they have to be equal. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to set those equal, 3x squared plus a. I want it to equal x minus 3 when, when, right, when x is 2. So I'm going to plug 2 in there, 3 times 2 squared plus a equals 2 minus 3. 2 squared is 4 times 3 is 12. 2 minus 3 is negative 1. You'd solve that. a equals negative 13. So that's what that number would have to be up here. So if you think about let's just double check it for a second. What I was trying to find out is when x was 2, I should get the same thing in both those equations. So if I plug 2 in, 2 squared is 4 times 3 is 12. Minus 13 is negative 1. Plug 2 in this one, 2 minus 3 is negative 1. So I get the same, same thing back out when I plug 2 in. That means that this point is actually 2, 1. Actually, it's supposed to be 2, negative 1, right? So actually, this graph is more like down here, I guess. You know, it's down here. But at that point, they share that point, 2, negative 1, right there. I'm going to skip over these graphing ones. I'm going to make a really quick video. I'll just use, um, but I'm going to do it. Uh, not here on the smart board because the, the calculator works better or not. So I'll, I'll do that separate. So look at number eight. Um, just uh, there'll be a separate video for that. So make sure you watch it. 
Uh, the last thing we need to talk about then is the intermediate value theorem. This is something that sounds really complicated, but the idea behind it actually is really simple. So once you, so kind of try to look beyond like all the terminology and understand, we have to understand the terminology, and that's the hard part. But make sure you understand the concept. The concept is quite simple. So what it says is this, if f is continuous from the interval from a to b, so this is the interval, and when they, when they say the interval, they're talking about the x values. For when I go to a, b, a to b, it has to be continuous, right? There's no, that means there's no breaks in the graph. Um, so that's the first part. Go ahead in your book there, circle continuous. For the, for the intermediate value theorem, it has to be continuous on the interval. Okay, and what it's saying is that if you pick a y value between f of a, that point right there, and f of b right there, so I pick any y value, in this case we're calling that y value k, the graph has to pass through that point. As long as k is between that y value and that y value, right, k is between there, then it has to pass through there. And they're calling that, that uh, x value c. Right, so it says, and there is at least one x value c between a and b such that f of c equals k. So it sounds really complicated, but all it's really saying is if I have these two points, the function's continuous between it. If I pick a y value between those two points, the graph has to cross through that y value. And when you look at that point, they're calling the, the x that you plug in to get the y, they're calling that x c. So let's kind of let's apply that on these examples. 9 says, does the intermediate value theorem guarantee a C value on the given interval? Well, there were two, two things you have to check to see if it guarantees it. One is it has to be continuous over the interval. The second thing is that your Y value, K, has to be between F of A and F of B. Those are the two things we're going to check. So let's look at part A, x squared minus x. Is it continuous on the interval from x is 0 to x is 5? The answer is yes. That's a polynomial. Polynomials are always, it's a parabola. They're always continuous. Uh, so the first one checks off. It is continuous. Okay, part B is, does this y value, does k is my y value, does it fall between the two y values on, my inter, on the interval from 0 to 5? Um, I don't know what those y values are, so here's what you're going to do every time. I've got to find out what f of 0 is. That's the y value where I'm starting. And I have to find out the ending point, f of 5. All right, those are my x values. I have to plug those in to find the y values. So if I plug 0 into this function up here, I get 0. If I plug 5 in, I get 25. Minus 5, I get 20. So the second thing is this y value right there, 12, has to be between those two, between the starting y value and the ending y value. And it is, right? 12 is between 0 and 20. So it meets the second condition. So the question was, does it guarantee a C value that, you know, can I, is it guarantee that I'll plug something in between, something between X is 0 and X is 5 will give me a Y value of 12? And the answer is yes. Just to make sure we understand this, what it's really saying is, right, I've got a point at 0, 0, and I've got a point at 5, 20. Um, the question is, will there be some X value that equals 12? And Right? This is a parabola, something like this. Um, if this is 12 right there, right, it's got to cross. This has to equal 12 at some point. The C, that this is K. K is 12. The C is just the X value, which it didn't ask for, but it might is going to in just a second. Okay, let's look at B. So I have this new function, X squared minus 4 over X minus 2. So the first thing is, is it continuous? Uh, so is it continuous? And the answer is, well, it's not down here, right? X cannot equal 2. Um, is 2 on the interval from 0 to 3? It, it is. So the question is, is it continuous on from when X equals 0 to X equals 3? And the answer is no. So I'm going to stop right there. It has to meet both those requirements, and it doesn't. So the question is, does it guarantee a C value on the given interval? And we would put no. That does not mean that it that it will never equal 4 between, you know, when x is 0 and x equals 3, but it just means that the intermediate value theorem does not guarantee it. Okay, 10, the last example, it says, find the value of c in example 9a. So over here, right, we said up here, f of c equals 12, and we said the intermediate value theorem guarantees there'll be some x value that will give me 12. So my y is 12, I'm trying to find the x, and we want to find that actual c value. Well, all I'm going to do is plug 12 in for y, right? Plug 12 in for f of x. So I would get 12 equals 
x squared minus x. I just need to solve that equation. So I'm going to minus the 12 over. Factor that. Uh, what? Minus 4 plus 3. Uh, so I get x equals 4 and negative 3. What happens a lot is we get to there and we're so excited because we feel like we've done it right and then we actually miss it. And here's the reason why. Right, I was trying to find out, C has to be on your interval. Your interval was from when x was 0 to where x was 5. Well, 4 is on that interval, right? 4 is between 0 and 5. Negative 3 is not. Right? It does not fit on that interval. So just make sure you're careful. You're, you're, you only want the x values that fit on the, on the interval. Okay? You don't want any that are outside of that. That could be a little bit tricky. Once you, again, the idea behind it is pretty simple, but the actual application of it could be a little bit confusing. Uh, anyway, hopefully that helped. Uh, let me know if you have questions. Um, but that's it for section, oh, and that's it except for that little extra video I'm going to make just with the calculator part. So, anyway, thanks guys.